Top Bed Talk. Monty Mython here. As we prepare to move into the next phase of the COVID crisis, we're going to be widening our focus here on Top Bed Talk. We will continue to deliver COVID-specific programmes, but we all have a huge additional responsibility as we try to reboot normal services. So although this piece is not directly related to COVID-19, we believe it's information that is crucial to the bigger task of rebuilding the healthcare system as we learn to adapt and live with this new virus. Thank you to our sponsors and to you, our listeners, for helping us to share this important information. Nick Majerison here, and of course, regular listeners to Top Med Talk will know it was at this time of year that Anesthesia 2020 was planned in Manchester. Unfortunately, it has been postponed to next year. So, all this week, we're playing some clips from last year's excellent conference. Enjoy. Hello, I'm Joff Lacey and welcome to Top Med Talk and our series of broadcasts from Anesthesia 2019, the international conference of the Royal College of Anesthetists here in London. And I'm delighted to be joined by Mike Swart, consultant anesthetist from Torbay and national co-lead for the Getting It Right first time for perioperative medicine and anaesthesia along with Chris Snowden. So Mike, thanks very much for joining us. Welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Now we wanted to have a quick chat about the first session, which was at times concerning (laughs) uh, because we were talking about the future of anaesthesia and notably talking about the ongoing development of technology and increasing reliance on technology. And Ramani Munising, which one of the speakers, started her talk by illustrating the enormous progress, you could say, or changes that have happened in anaesthesia just over the last 50 years, and then try to make us look to what may happen in the next 50 years. Yeah. Now, wh- where do you see the specialty of anaesthesia in the next coming decades? I think we'll be taking on more of a, a leadership role rather than a delivery role of anaesthesia. And... By that I mean I think we will be working with others both preoperatively and postoperatively and at some point interoperatively mm. to support, uh, for lack of a better word, non-clinician anaesthetists mm. or non-medical anaesthetists. So in terms of the technical aspect that it would be handed over as such to, to the non physician anaesthetist or that even technology may take over that element? I think it's easy to predict that we change. Yeah. It's difficult to predict when it's going to happen. Yeah. We are becoming more automated. We know that there are driverless cars available now. The technology is there for motor vehicles. Mm. It's getting closer for delivery of anaesthetics. I don't think that means you will not have doctor anaesthetists or physician anaesthetists. I think you will. I think their role will change. Though I suppose you won't get rid of the physician anaesthetist, but they may not necessarily be in the operating room. I mean, uh, Maxine Canazon showed us a totally automated delivery of of an anaesthetic controlling the hemodynamics and the depths of anaesthesia without a human involved at all, apart from setting the parameters at the beginning. That's now, you know, in 10, 20 years' time, you may have a series of theatres with that set up and then a single physician anaesthetist being involved from a periphery. Do you think that's a possibility? I think we're going to probably go into a transition rather than a moment where everything changes. Yeah. So I I think what will probably happen is you will start to use the the technology with a human present, and that may initially be a physician anaesthetist. Yeah. It may then then move on to being a non-physician anaesthetist with a physician anaesthetist available. And as we demonstrate it is safe, yeah. or demonstrate it is safer, then we will progressively change. I'm, I'm not making the prediction of where we end up. Yeah, I'm just making hard. the prediction of the, the road or journey we're on. Because I think Professor Callanson alluded to this, that there is potential drawbacks to progressions in technology and most notably when we talk about artificial intelligence in healthcare there's the concern that humans are removed from the process but he really highlighted the benefit of technology and specifically artificial intelligence in just augmenting the clinician's capability he gave a very nice example of a reasonably junior cardiologist being able to use echocardiograms to the similar uh, sensitivities as their senior counterparts with the addition of yes. artificial intelligence. Now, yes. that's, that's got to be 
a great thing, not something that we should be scared of. In it, way. That isn't going to render cardiologists out of a job. No, exactly. Man and machine, not one taking over the other. The other interesting points I think we came across, particularly with Ramani, was this technological singularity. There's a point in about uh, 40 years or something where the intelligence of the, the, the computers and machines that we are using will take over that of humans. What did you make of that? I, I, that was quite a striking point for me. I th- thought a l- lot about this over a long period of time. I'm not convinced that there is this moment where the machines take over. N- no, they might not take over, but their capabilities okay. well, what, may what, take over us. What I think you need to th- look at is some fairly simple examples of, of recent changes with technology. Okay. If you take Uber, it's a taxi. It's just a different way of call- hailing the taxi and mm. a different way of paying the, ta- paying the taxi driver. Yeah. But it's still a taxi. Yeah. I think if you now look at um, humans and medicine... You have to ask yourself, so what is it, the, what is the bit that you need the physician for? What is that, what is the, what's the bit that's different between a physician and a machine? Now, for me, the key bit of what a physician does is they make decisions and they take responsibility. Then there's also this consultation relationship where you find information about somebody and they trust you to help Mm. them with that decision now the machines can only take over if they can replicate um, what's happening with us now is Mm. we're talking to each other listening a bit to each other probably talking more than listening (laughs) we're watching facial expression hand movements and you've got to have the machine to be able to mimic the human if the machine is going to take over I'm not certain when that's... I, I'm not, I don't... I think that's going to be a much bigger development. But I, I don't think that's what this is about. I think this is, um, as you say, man and machine to have better outcome. Yeah. And well, I think you're still going to... Ramani alluded to it on a couple of occasions. You are still going to need the human for the consultation or for the human interaction. Now, I know other people will say, oh, we've got fantastic holograms now. And actually, some people feel safer talking to a hologram than a human. Uh, That may be true, but I don't think it's going to replace the human. I think you go, that's a bit like rehearsing your talk to the mirror. Yeah. But you're still going to end up having to have the interaction with a human. True, and I think of of all industries uh, facing up to the potential changes that uh, technology and artificial intelligence brings, I think medicine is the one way, you know, the replacement of yeah. the human definitely, yeah. you know, th- as you mentioned, the trust, the interaction yeah. that occurs yeah. in a patient pathway, that can't be replicated with technology. Well, I'll, I'll give you another one that I... I, I uh, it's, a, it's a humorous and possibly not true story, but I'll say it anyway. <laughs> They're always the best, <laughs> don't I? <laughs> I missed our last clinical effectiveness session back in Torbay Hospital. But I heard um, at the end of last week that I had the best patient pain scores in recovery. Congratulations. Thank you very much. (laughs) Now, I wish I was there (laughs) to explain why. Because as an an elderly anaesthetist, my block skill is the worst. (laughs) I I, I will put myself down as the worst local anaesthetic blocker in the department. But my interpersonal skills at finding the best person to do the block is fantastic. <laughs> now, that's called being a doctor yeah, as opposed to being a technician. Yeah, that's true. That's true. You'll always need, <laughs> always need that human element. You need that human element. All right, well, okay. Well, we're going to have to uh, cut it short there because we've got the next session. But, Mike Swat, as always, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank, thank you very, very much. much. Top Bed Talk. Desiree Chapel here. Just a quick reminder, subscribe to Top Med Talk. We're a daily source of news and conversation focused on perioperative care. We bring you all the latest talk from all the major conferences in the perioperative space. We can also be found on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and we now have a free mailing list with special offers and additional goodies for subscribers. Go check us out at topmedtalk.com. That's www.topmedtalk.com.